we will be the technical hosts of this uh, Jesuit conference of Asia Pacific. But the uh, host, I think, is Father uh, Adrianus Suyati. So, for the time being, we will mute your microphone so that we can uh, listen to the uh, welcoming speeches and also the uh, speech later. So, when you want to uh, ask question or you want to say something, please uh, unmute your microphone first. And then uh, you can you can talk. So we will be the um, technical host of of this meeting, but the host will be Father uh, Adriano Suyati. So now I think I will pass the microphone to Father Adriano uh, Suyati. Father Adriano. You can you can unmute. Yes. Thank you, Bauda. Your brothers and sisters. Good morning. Good morning. It is my pleasure to welcome all of you, and it is really so wonderful to see you all here, although through virtual meetings. Very special thanks and warm welcome to our speakers and moderators for their generosity to share with us their expertise and experiences. We have here Mr. Ronald Mendoza, PhD, and Father Patricius Mutiara Andalas, and also Ms. Wi Martin, and Ms. Lisa St. Pujiartanti will join on Wednesday. They are all our speakers. And special thanks also to Father Dennis King, Father Pedro Walpole, and Christina, who will uh, moderate all the session for three days uh, meetings. We are grateful having Father Tony Moreno and Jacob staff, who are always available to support and also to guide us. And we also thanks to Sanata Dharma University who hosting this uh, meeting. And of course, last but not least, to all of you who are making available to participate in this uh, 3D meetings. Discernment process and action plan for implementation of the universal apostolic preferences in GCAP happy in moving forward. But in the midst of our journey, we are facing an unprecedented context and situation, namely COVID-19 pandemic. The pandemic has created emergencies in many sectors in our life. in the mission of justice. The spirit of the GCAP President's invitation to us on the importance of collaboration from different sectors in our conference, we, the organizing committee consisting of six sectors and secretaries in GCAP, have an initiative to conduct three days virtual meetings that will take place today and on Wednesday and on Friday in this week. The objective of our reflection and discernment is to discern the cause for the Society of Jesus in Asia Pacific that might be emerging from this unprecedented experience of the COVID-19 pandemic and the implication for the conference a communal discernment who will share their expertise and experiences in line with for universal apostolic preferences. Mr. Ronald Mendoza, PSD, and Father Patricius Mutiara Andalas will give us inputs from the perspective of the poor 
and the spirituality in today's sessions. And the session will be moderated by Father Kim. So we thanks to them for their availability to support us. And on Wednesday, we will have the session where Ms. Sui Martin and Ms. Lisa S.T. Pujiartanti will speak about ecology and youth. And Father Petru will moderate the sessions. And after listening to the inputs given by the speakers, then we will continue sharing and discerning the impl implementation of Christina will facilitate our group sharing and connected each other so we strongly recommend you to participate in all these sessions we hope that our virtual meeting will be fruitful to continuing our journey for the implementation of the universal apostolic preferences in GCAP missions. So finally, I would like, I wish you to, you all enjoy our meeting and reflection. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Father Adrianus. Suyati for the uh, welcoming speech and also explaining the uh, plan that we are going to have within these um, three days that we are going to have the uh, the conference. So, uh, for your information, this meeting is also being uh, recorded and also we uh, streamline the meeting in YouTube. So, in case. Uh, you know, you want to share the uh, meeting to your colleagues. I think you can um, you can share that uh, with with our colleagues. Okay. Uh, next, now we will be listening to the uh, welcoming speech from Father Tony Moreno. So, Father Tony, time is yours. Selamat pagi to all. Good morning. Uh, thank you so much for coming here to this virtual conversation. Uh, special thanks as well to our host, uh, Dr. Eka Priyatma, the Sanada Dharma Rector. And actually, this activity is a collaborative initiative on the part of the social ministries, the Association of Jesuit Colleges and Universities, Basic Education, Youth Ministry, Reconciliation with Creation, with the assistance of Christina Kang. Uh, Adria has already thanked the resource persons, but let me reiterate my deep gratitude for our, our speakers for today and for tomorrow. For today, we have uh, Father Mutiara Andalas, a lecturer of Sanata Dharma, and also Dr. Ron Mendoza, Dean of the Ateneo School of Government. And for tomorrow, our speakers are uh, Lisa, Miss Lisa Hartanti, lecturer at Atma Jaya, and Sue Martin, uh, Assistant Coordinator of Reconciliation with Creation Network. I'm very, very grateful to to all of you for giving time uh, and sharing your expertise and special thanks as well to the moderators of the day for today we have father dennis kim a lecturer of sogang university and tomorrow father pedro walpole uh, coordinator of the global echo jesuit many of us see the pandemic as a big destruction in fact it has upset uh, many of our plans. It has made us go through a long period of uncertainty and difficulty. It has increased joblessness, hunger, and cases of mental issues. It has claimed the lives of more than 803,000 people, registered over 23 million cases of COVID-19, 
this could even be more and God knows how many more waves and spikes we have yet to endure. During the pandemic, we also see democratic institutions being eroded, especially by populist leadership. We can cite uh, Bolsonaro in Brazil, Modi in India, Trump in the US, and closer to home, Duterte in the Philippines. But rather than just simply see the pandemic as a destruction, which in a way it is, one needs to engage it and not just wait for the so-called normal time before we can act. In fact, it has become the center stage upon which our universal apostolic preferences or so-called UAPs and the Jacob Plan must be rooted and contextualized. This series of conversations, it is hoped, will aid our discernment to locate the UAPs and the Jacob Plan. Once again, I'm truly grateful to all of you for taking time and uh, taking stock of what the pandemic has in store for us here in Asia Pacific. I pray that we may have a fruitful time together. Thank you very much. Terima kasih. Thank you. Terima kasih, Romo Tony Moreno. Thank you very much, Father Tony Moreno, for the um, opening remarks. And now I think we will come to the uh, first program that, that we have here. So we'll be having... Um, we, we can hear you. We can hear you. Mas Andi, tidak kedengeran. Can you hear me now? Uh, can, you uh, can you hear me now? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, um, thank you, thank you, you but, uh, Tony, Tony Moreno, for the, for the um, opening opening remark. remark. Now, now we will. Uh, uh, can you can hear, you hear me? me? Still? Okay. Still? okay. Now we will, now we will go, go to, go to, to the, the first session, session. and. and um, um, Father, Father Dennis, Dennis Kim, Kim will, be will be the moderator, the moderator for, this for this session. Uh, session. So, so Father, Father Dennis, Dennis time, is, time yours. is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Suyadi, and uh, for inviting me to moderate this session. Uh, my name is Dennis Kim. I'm a Jesuit and the working in the Sogam University teaching sociology. And also, I worked in the social apostle coordinator uh, so about 10 years ago. It's already 10, 10 years. So good to be back and to see my old friends. Uh, today, we have two speakers. And because of time limit, I'm, I'd like to just briefly introduce the speakers. The first, uh, Father Andalas. It teaches at the Cadre Religious Education Study Program and teacher and training education faculty at Santa Dama University and very much engaged in the low class learners without digital inclusivity in online learning. So we may hear, we may hear so his interest and his passion in his, in his, in his presentation. So now, Father Andalas, so you have a uh, and almost, yeah, no, almost uh, 25 minutes. So, I'd like to give you, I'd like to give a microphone to Father Andalas. Thank you. Thank you. The title, the title of my, of my presentation, presentation is the, is the pedagogy, pedagogy of intimacy and Ignatian spirituality, uh, uh, animating learning uh, amid the COVID-19 pandemic, pandemic season. season. It is actually an, an underway work, work uh, because, uh, because as Gustavo Gutierrez, Gustavo Gutierrez uh, remarks, uh, remarks on liberation, liberation theology, theology that Theological, theological reflection is actually the second step and the first step is praxis. And, and we are at Sanada Dharma. We are, we are in the, in the process, process of uh, living, 
the new, the new pedagogy, pedagogy namely, namely the pedagogy, pedagogy of intimacy. intimacy. My, My question in this essay is, is how does, how does Ignatian, Ignatian spirituality, spirituality uh, animate, uh, animate intimacy, intimacy in, in online, online learning? learning? Actually, Actually uh, spirituality is my second adventure in, in thinking, thinking about, about this theme. theme. Uh, uh, my, my first adventure, adventure is, actually is actually related to pedagogy. And, and I, I see, see especially, especially uh, there, uh, there are at least, at least uh, three uh, uh, towering pedagogies related to online learning. The first, the first one is seamless, seamless learning. learning. The, the second, second one is Ubi Kuitos learning. And then, and then the third, the third one, one is Yutakochi. Uh, seamless, seamless learning emphasizes emphasize the, the centrality of learning time beyond, beyond school, school hours. hours. Upi with us learning emphasizes the centrality, the centrality of, the of the home and its surrounding beyond classroom. And Yutakochi emphasizes self-determined learning by students. Here at our campus, uh, Sanada Dharma University, uh, there is a growing interdisciplinary partnership uh, especially between the Center for Learning Development and Innovation and the Center of Ignatian Studies uh, where uh, I have been involved in these two uh, studies to animate pedagogy during the pandemic season. Uh, this picture uh, really captivates me uh, it is a picture of Pope Francis uh, walking with his assistant in the empty street of Rome. And at the same time, I see that uh, it gives me an idea about uh, spiritual mobility. Uh, spirituality mainly relates to mobility, ability, resilience, and hope. Uh, on the contrary, and the spirituality relates to immobility, disability, helplessness, and hopelessness. And then another text that also captivates me when I search for an appropriate pedagogy uh, amid uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic season is by uh, the bishops uh, synods on young people, faith and vocational discernment. We now live in a culture without boundaries, marked by new spatio-temporal relationships, partly because of the digital communication and constant mobility. In this context, an understanding of the Paris defined solely by territorial borders and incapable of engaging the faithful in a wide range of initiatives, especially the young, would imprison the Paris in an acceptable stagnation and a, in a worryingly repetitive pastoral cycle. I see that uh, this tendency uh, doesn't happen only in uh, Paris, but also in educational institutions, including Sanata Dharma University and also your schools. I think uh, perhaps for many people, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic outbreak is first and foremost, without a doubt, is a health issue. However, for us, this pandemic outbreak goes beyond health issues. This pandemic and its death is an issue of both education and spirituality. So my question is, how was Ignatius Loyola, who lived amid epidemic and in a hospital church, involved in the birth of a mobility characterized spirituality? I see that Ignatian spirituality is a mobility characterized uh, spirituality amid the societal and also ecclesial crisis. 
This is an experience of Saint Ignatius Loyola that is probably often neglected when we discuss about his autobiography. Uh, it is when he visited uh, the sick because of the plague. Finding a sick person, Ignatius comforted and encouraged him a while, and his hands began to hurt so that it seemed he had caught at the plug. And etc. as you can uh, uh, read from the presentation. What I want to emphasize is that we need to include Ignatius Loyola's experiences of being a patient, living amid epidemic, consoling patient in a hospital church that makes our picture of him more holistic. So I see him as a spiritual pedagogue in my presentation. And, and how spirituality and also education meets at a certain point. And I see that the meeting, that the meeting point uh, happens as we can uh, read in the spiritual exercises uh, and also in his biography, autobiography. God treated him at this just as a schoolmaster treats a we child. Can, we can't hear you. Okay, for a moment. I, I cannot can hear. Can you hear us now? Uh, we are sorry for the interruption. Or because he had no one to teach him, or because of the strong desire uh, himself had been given to serve him, he clearly believed and has always believed that God treats him in this way. So the close contacts of learners and the broader contacts of the society affected the pandemic challenged us to customize learning. So as Father Moreno, uh, Moreno mentioned uh, in the uh, opening remark, that uh, this pandemic season is a pedagogical kairos and even a spiritual kairos for us uh, who work in the center of Ignatian studies. The migration of learning from offline to online invites us, Jesuit schools, to create intimacy in the physical, social distancing. And intimacy lies at the heart of this pedagogy. The intimacy redeems the impersonal relationship between teachers and students that suffer social distancing. And this is what I imagine when I think about the pedagogy of intimacy. That teachers should allow knowledgeable learners to interact directly with knowledge, even God of wisdom. So we consider learners differently as knowledgeable students. And probably the biggest obstacle for students' implementation of online education in our schools is surface learning, where learning is uh, oriented mostly for having high scores in our courses. And the second one that I think it is important when we imagine the pedagogy of intimacy is that 
Jesuit schools with an Ignatian vision need to promote digital inclusivity. Especially our experience with uh, students at Sanada Dharma, where most of them come from middle and uh, low class uh, society, uh, digital inclusivity is a must for our school here. And the third one that I think characterizes uh, the pedagogy of uh, intimacy is active education. Active education in the Jesuit school means creating an academic ecosystem for, for students to learn independently, to scrutinize knowledge, to learn creatively, and also to learn reflectively. And this is what we experience with students when we invite them to, uh, to give us feedbacks about online learning that uh, we have uh, done uh, at our uh, campus. That students' criticism of online learning as being synonymous with multiple assignments requires us to redefine online education to decentralize school and to recentralize home. The pedagogy of uh, intimacy recentralizes home, especially in the situation uh, where often we experience school centralism. Uh, this picture is quite engaging for me because when uh, this student enter the first day, uh, of coming to Sanata Dharma, I actually welcome her uh, because uh, she is a, uh, a student with uh, disability and uh, her father uh, asked me whether uh, she can get uh, some uh, compensation uh, from uh, doing activities that, uh, that are probably too heavy for her, yeah? And I uh, I let him and I also let her to decide which program that she want to we wanted to join and then which program that probably it is better for her not uh, to join because of her uh, physical disability. Yeah. And at that time, uh, her father actually uh, cried and and uh, she really uh, he really appreciated. Uh, the the campus attitude uh, of welcoming uh, students, uh, student with uh, uh, disability. An intimate atmosphere where students experience academic, spiritual, and even financial accompaniment characterizes also the pedagogy of intimacy. So. Uh, if I can say uh, a short based on our Sanada Dharma experience in implementing the pedagogy of uh, intimacy, uh, I would like to conclude that spiritual mobility has animated online learning at Sanada Dharma as a Jesuit university. And Sanada Dharma University is one birthplace for the pedagogy of intimacy. Thank you. And that's all my presentation. And I would love to receive your responses and uh, further conversation on this theme. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Father Andalas. Uh, so his presentation was how the Sanatadama University respond to this you know, time of uh, the, the pandemic era. Especially he emphasized the pedagogy of intimacy. And so it, and he suggests the digital inclusiveness and also the spiritual mobility. So we have to move out uh, from the uh, survival mode to the spiritual mobility. And 
in his presentation, he it was in, uh, for me it was very uh, sort of fresh to remind that Sen Ignacio himself was a patient and also he lived in the, in the pandemic era. So thank you very much. So we are we are hearing we are hearing to in order to discern what is happening and what is the call in this uh, pandemic era. So Father Andalas present in the. In the out of the Santa Dama University context and in the, so, uh, addressing to the education and the pedagogy. And now I'm going to give a time to uh, the professor Mendoza. Uh, he is a dean as, as a dean of the, gov the School of Government and Ateneo de Manila University. And So, so he has many experiences and many, so many his work involved in the international development, uh, public finance and international cooperation. And his recent books he published include, just a very recent one, The Children in Crisis, uh, Protecting the Vulnerable and Promoting Recovery for All it's in 2012. And another book is forthcoming, The Building Inclusive Democracies in ASEAN. So through his work, we can, we can just see the, his interest really addressing to our, you know, the, our need or we like to hear. And so, so due to the time limit, again, I'm going to give time to the directory to the Professor Mendoza. So please welcome him. <laughs> Thank you, Father Dennis. Uh, I defer to you playing the video that I pre-recorded uh -huh. so that I can uh, definitely stick to time. Okay. Okay, thank you. So Paeka, I think we'll play the video for us. Good evening, everybody. As you've seen by now, this isn't a normal convention. It's not a normal time. So Oops. tonight, I want to talk as plainly as I can about the stakes in this election. Because what uh, we Father, do, that's not me. these next seven <laughs> days, will Wait, echo wait. through <laughs> generations to come. Ah, sorry. I'm in Philadelphia, <laughs> where our Constitution was drafted. Uh, this one. Yeah, this one. I, I, think. Mm -hmm. Young, I uh, have I haven't run yet for president, oh, Father. Right now. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it was different link. I think this this one. Yes, Is it this yes, one? Thank you very much for the chance to share with you some of our ongoing research on the COVID nineteen health pandemic and the Yes, Faika, yes, this one associated economic slowdown uh, to this crisis. Let me begin by first showing you uh, some of the uh, analysis coming from the World Bank. This is an analysis of uh, essentially the uh, global per capita GDP growth rates uh, spanning the period from 1875 to the present. And uh, the effort by the World Bank here is to try to compare the impending global recession uh, that is predicted uh, this year, 2020, with previous global recessions that have taken place all the way uh, until uh, 1875. Uh, and we will see here from the, their analysis and the collection of data that uh, they predict that the global recession that will take place in 2020 will be the deepest uh, global recession since World War II. And it will be distinct in the number of countries that will be involved in the economic slowdown. Uh, if you will see here on uh, this second figure, this is the percent of uh, economies that will be involved in the global recession. And uh, this year, which is 2020, is distinct when compared to other years because 
more economies will be involved in, in the recession. And in fact, the uh, number of economies involved is even higher than the number of economies involved in the global recession in the 1930s. So this uh, actually emphasizes the extent to which COVID-19 has impacted on uh, many countries uh, and will likely uh, cause a global recession for 2020 as predicted by many international organizations. Now, uh, with that kind of uh, significant global economic slowdown, we also e expect uh, a lot of socioeconomic implications uh, across countries and at the world level. So here, uh, the projected uh, poverty impact of COVID-19 uh, as the world slows down, uh, the economy slows, slows down, is that it could generate 176 million additional poor people defined at living uh, on less than $3.20 a day, and an additional 177 million uh, poor people defined uh, on those living uh, on less than $5.50 a day. So this is equivalent to an increase in the poverty rate of 2.3 percentage points compared to the non-COVID-19 scenario. So clearly, um, the slowdown itself, because of its uh, extent and depth, will likely push many, many millions uh, of people across the world into poverty. Uh, as uh, we see more uh, people and families pushed into poverty, we'll also see uh, forecasts of many more millions of people pushed into hunger. Uh, and here, uh, there are estimates that at a minimum, another 83 million people and possibly as many as 132 million may go hungry in 2020 as a result of the economic recession triggered by COVID-19. What does this mean for the Asian region? Well, Asia remains home to the greatest number of undernourished at 381 million people. Africa is second with 250 million, followed by Latin America and the Caribbean with 48 million. The global uh, prevalence of undernourishment or overall percentage of hungry people has changed little at 8.9%, but the absolute numbers have been rising since 2014. So the point uh, to make here is that even before uh, the COVID-19 health pandemic, which uh, basically uh, exploded into the scene in early 2020, even before that, uh, that disease uh, started to spread, uh, many regions in the world already had millions of undernourished citizens and millions of hungry uh, uh, people, so that um, the disease itself is expected to exacerbate some of the, these pre-existing poverty uh, trends. Now, the other point to make is that uh, the uh, pandemic and the associated economic slowdown is also going to start to um, put downward pressure on global remittances. Now, why is this important? Uh, if you think about remittances, these are usually counter-cyclical flows, which means roughly that uh, when you have a crisis, you may expect more remittances uh, because it acts like a buffer uh, to many types of crises. Unfortunately, this time around, uh, for those countries that do uh, anticipate remittances, because of the extent of COVID-19 impacting not just the recipient countries, but many of the source countries, including in the Middle East, uh, we expect that uh, remittances will also be
the Philippines is now technically in recession with two straight quarters uh, of negative growth. So the lockdown has pushed the Philippine economy into recession, particularly on quarter two with minus 16.5% uh, GDP growth, as I mentioned. And meanwhile, the Philippines overtook Indonesia as the country with the most COVID-19 cases in Southeast Asia during this period uh, when we were in lockdown. So, so the way to understand the, way uh, the lockdown is... Uh, the lockdown and mobility restrictions which have been applied to the economy writ large are principally meant to buy uh, domestic health systems and social protection systems time to catch up uh, in order to build up their absorptive capacity uh, in uh, preparation for the bigger risks that the disease brings in. So what you do is you apply a lockdown, you apply mobility restrictions, uh, in order for these systems in health, primarily uh, in social protection, but also um, the test, trace, and treat systems so that they catch up and become stronger during the lockdown so that at some future point, when the number of cases start to decline, you will be able to lift the lockdown and rely on these stronger systems so that you can prevent a flare-up of the COVID-19 disease. Now, it's therefore very important and very critical for countries to succeed during the lockdown in boosting their health systems, in boosting their social protection systems, and in limiting the number of COVID-19 cases and making uh, the epidemiological curve go down, uh, as um, it has become a quite common phrase to flatten the COVID-19 curve. Unfortunately for the Philippines, that was not the case. And even though the Philippines has applied one of the longest lockdowns uh, in the world, it still uh, had runaway uh, increase in COVID-19 uh, cases. And in fact, uh, compared to ASEAN, uh, now ranks among the highest in terms of COVID-19 cases. So um, here are some facts and figures on the, on the lockdown itself. Uh, the lockdown cost uh, 18 billion pesos daily uh, for the national economy, mostly in terms of lost output. Uh, and it has translated into a lot of um, essentially uh, uh, pain and, and um, loss of welfare, loss of jobs for uh, Filipinos, primarily through the channel of uh, closing firms. So uh, the Department of Trade and Industry ran a survey in June of 2020 and found that 26% of businesses have been forced to close during the lockdown, primarily because of the depressed demand and also the mobility restrictions, which impacted uh, both their supply chains as well as uh, the ability for their consumers to actually reach them. Um, uh, an associated factoid here is that the Department of Labor and, and Employment estimates that about 10 million workers will lose their jobs during the COVID-19 pandemic. And Social Weather Station, a think tank uh, in the Philippines that does uh, very, very credible surveys recently released a report that 5.2 million Filipinos, uh, sorry, 5.2 million uh, Filipino families have gone hungry during the lockdown period. PIDS, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies, which is the top government think tank, has also released a study recently that uh, estimates 1.5 million Filipinos will be sliding back into poverty due to COVID-19. Again, all of these facts and figures emphasize that COVID-19 health pandemic has actually created massive economic uh, uh, contraction and also uh, reduction in welfare and also uh, impact on many businesses and many workers, primarily because of the lockdown itself and the continuing inability of the Philippines to begin to relax the lockdown under conditions of uh, stronger social protection and stronger uh, healthcare system. So I just want to show you some um, images, and please forgive me, some of these images are graphic, uh, of um, the instances in which Filipino citizens have found themselves under the lockdown itself. Uh, and these are anecdotal evidence. We don't have uh, figures on all of the citizens that uh, experience this kind of um, of uh, event during the lockdown, 
but it is uh, illustrative that many Filipinos have actually faced dire situations during the lockdown. In particular, uh, many of them have not actually sought healthcare uh, despite having a uh, high risk of having contracted the disease or having contracted the disease already. So here are images from a poor community, a highly dense, uh, densely populated community in Quezon City where someone passed away during the night and um, essentially the, the dead body was collected uh, the next day as it was reported. Uh, it was collected by uh, basically the local government. And you will see uh, in these images that in this community, it is um, easy to see that uh, the densely populated uh, areas, particularly in Metro Manila, raise the risk of um, the spread of the disease, the easy spread of the disease. And what makes it worse is that uh, many now begin to expect that many Filipinos are uh, not really seeking healthcare uh, because of the high out-of-pocket costs uh, that healthcare in the Philippines uh, implies. So uh, this is one of the principal challenges uh, that many analysts are now pointing to, that because of the high healthcare costs to begin with, even before COVID-19, the tendency for Filipinos and Filipino families to seek healthcare is not that strong. So health seeking is, is not that evolved, it's not that well supported. So if the government does not send signals that uh, it will support uh, healthcare costs in a very big way, then uh, it is less surprising that many Filipinos uh, continue to hide uh, their symptoms, which then increases the probability that COVID-19 becomes uncontrolled and spreads in highly dense uh, urban areas. This is another image, this time not in Quezon City, but in uh, Cebu. And this is an area community that has been locked down due to a flare up of COVID-19. In fact, there have been several flare ups in, of COVID-19 in various parts of uh, densely populated Cebu city. And you can see here that there's a poster that pretty much reflects the sentiments of the community here. If you cannot feed us, free us. The spread of COVID-19 is not our fault. Stop the discrimination. So this appears to be a common sentiment in many communities, uh, at least based on anecdotal evidence, that uh, there uh, appears to be strong discrimination against poor communities that are now being blamed for the continued spread of COVID-19. And uh, the troubling um, messaging here is that uh, many of these communities feel as though they are further marginalized, further discriminated against, and do not receive adequate support in order to comply with the lockdown and the mobility restrictions. So this is something I want to point out as one of the big challenges of the Philippines and perhaps other uh, Asia Pacific uh, countries uh, and other developing countries. If you do not have citizens who feel that there is adequate support uh, for healthcare, adequate support for social protection, there is likely going to be weak trust in the policies rolled out by government and weak compliance with the restrictions and the policies uh, that have been rolled out to actually control the disease. So here, uh, it has in fact uh, reflected in recent uh, uh, pronouncements by government itself that it cannot afford to extend uh, the lockdown such as it is because the funds that it needs to actually sustain those communities and keep on feeding them, keep on supporting them under lockdown, because remember, they're not earning any incomes while in lockdown, um, because there, there is no longer uh, a massive budget to actually sustain this. So part of the challenge of a country like the Philippines, but perhaps many other countries, is to try and hit that uh, key uh, situation, that key period when you apply a lockdown for a certain period only, but then uh, strengthen health and social protection to such an extent that you can begin to, lock, to, to lift the lockdown and, and not keep it uh, very, very long. Otherwise, the lockdown itself will limit your ability to strengthen healthcare and to strengthen social protection because of the depressed tax revenues 
and the depressed economy uh, that will then begin to constrain uh, even the government's ability to respond. So this is a key uh, debacle now being uh, str struggled with by the Philippine government that be because it has kept the lockdown so long, even its means to actually respond will now begin to be limited because of the uh, depression in uh, economic output and activity, as well as tax revenues. What, does, uh, what kind of environment does this create? Well, it creates a very negative and pessimistic environment. So Filipinos, uh, when surveyed by SWS around June, there was a record 43% of Filipinos who saw life worsening uh, in the next 12 months. So this is a very, very pessimistic assessment of the next 12 months uh, as reflected by uh, roughly 43% of the, of the population. And uh, part of this pessimism may have to do with the exacerbated uh, inequality that now the country faces as, as far as uh, struggling with the COVID-19 health pandemic. So um, let me just mention here that the Philippines, like many other uh, developing countries, faces um, the twin challenges of social and, social and political, actually uh, triple challenges of social, political, and economic inequality. And uh, this existed even before the COVID-19 pandemic, but uh, the pandemic has a way of um, exacerbating and making it worse. And let me show you the emerging uh, facts and evidence here. Uh, the first point to make is that um, the COVID-19 health pandemic threatens to exacerbate vaccine nationalism practiced uh, across countries. What does this mean? Vaccine nationalism is when countries try to secure vaccines only for themselves while forgetting uh, the inequality, the potential inequality in, in access to the vaccine uh, when you look at the capability of countries to pay for these vaccines. And so uh, it's well known that many countries with the capability to pay, mainly the richer countries, have now contracted some of the bigger uh, pharmaceuticals to try and secure vaccines for their own uh, citizens. Uh, this is uh, partly to be expected, but par partly unfortunate uh, if it actually leads to an inequality in access to the vaccine when it becomes available, if it becomes available. So this is something that... Um, may exacerbate international inequality uh, in terms of access to healthcare and certainly the vaccine. Uh, the other point to make is that um, the COVID-19 health pandemic has forced many countries to adapt in terms of their workforce uh, as well as their education systems, uh, to name a few. And uh, in terms of education systems, uh, the movement towards online uh, learning uh, has been uh, fairly straightforward in countries with uh, high uh, technological ac access and ability to adapt to this form of learning. But uh, this is going to be very difficult for many other countries that have highly unequal access to the internet and the types of technology needed to succeed in this uh, so-called new normal. So in Asia, uh, the digital inequality is is quite um, uh, is is quite acute. If you look at over eighty percent internet penetration in countries like Singapore, Brunei, and Malaysia, but less than sixty percent in countries like Indonesia, Thailand, and Cambodia, and I believe the Philippines uh, is around that that area as well of sixty percent access to the internet, and only around forty percent in uh, countries like Myanmar and Vietnam, at least according to this. Uh, World Bank report. So what this suggests is that even as across countries you may have uh, inequality in ability to adapt to the COVID-19 health pandemic, you may have also the same types of inequality exacerbated within countries, uh, considering that not everyone has access to the ability to adapt to the technologies, to the uh, platforms, and, and other necessary um, means to adapt to that new normal. This is just an image uh, just to drive home the point. Countries, uh, if you talk about online education, you will have uh, many millions of children with the means to actually adapt to this new platform, but many more millions of children that are unlikely to be able to adapt well. 
And I find this quote uh, very useful in summarizing the unequalizing uh, potential of COVID-19 uh, as a health pandemic. And this is due to Damien Barr. Uh, he actually uh, said this, I believe, as a response to this uh, attempt to unify uh, uh, people by saying that we are all in the same uh, boat. We are all under the same conditions. In fact, we are not. countries but also within countries as far as the unequalizing potential uh, impact of COVID-19. Let me begin to end by discussing some of the political uh, environment that may actually be um, exacerbated or impacted as well uh, by the evolving COVID-19 health pandemic as well as the uh, economic slowdown associated with it. And it's important to begin with the recognition that even before COVID-19, many countries were already struggling with a political shock, which was populism. So the wave of populism affecting many countries, uh, even before uh, the health pandemic, uh, may have actually impacted on their ability to respond to the pandemic, to become resilient to the pandemic. And I believe this because uh, some of the main ingredients needed for a more successful response to the COVID-19 health pandemic includes such ingredients as social cohesion, trust, and inclusion, particularly in healthcare systems, as well as social protection systems. And these, some of these ingredients are the very same uh, elements that populist regimes are not good at strengthening, and in fact, have been shown to actually contradict. So let me just point out here that uh, studies have already been made on what populists do to democratic systems. And I find this quote very telling. According to our research, populist governments have deepened corruption, eroded individual rights, and inflicted serious damage on democratic institutions. Now, uh, for countries like the Philippines with populist tendencies, these are certainly big risks that we now uh, need to face in addition to COVID-19, which may actually exacerbate those pre-existing uh, risks of populism. And true enough, we are seeing some of these populist tendencies reflected in the response to COVID-19 itself. Now, let me just, uh, so this is one of our government officials, uh, and I will just loosely translate that he's basically saying that most of the problem lies in the people, that it's the people who are undisciplined that is causing the continued uh, spread of COVID-19. Uh, in his words, he's calling the people pasaway or undisciplined. So uh, it's very troubling to hear government officials emphasize this, particularly technocrats. And this is another government official who is in fact in charge of the testing and tracing uh, uh, strategy of the government. And he sees fit to say that we think it is testing, tracing, healthcare system, advancement in technology, but actually it is not. It is plain and simple discipline of the population. So this is very troubling to hear, especially from a technocrat, that you are actually passing the blame on to citizens instead of admitting that the accountability of government uh, to actually set up these systems, to actually adapt these technologies for a more uh, aggressive and effective test, trace, and treat system, as well as COVID-19 response, which uh, until now has not actually been quite strong in the Philippines. So uh, I believe this is just part of the uh, tendency towards populist messaging that we are seeing, not just in the Philippines, mind you, but in other countries as well. And here is another government official who even suggested to start a shame campaign for those ignoring the COVID-19 crisis. And particularly those in poor communities, uh, in densely packed communities. Uh, and in fact, um, we're seeing that the emerging evidence points to uh, not to uh, the lack of discipline uh, of uh, Filipinos, but actually to high compliance by Filipinos. So here is emerging evidence using Google data, um, basically showing that uh, if you look at the mobility of uh, Filipinos during the lockdown, there was in fact a 90% drop on people going out during the height of the lockdown, which actually suggests high compliance 
uh, with the mobility restrictions and the lockdown policy. So this actually uh, contradicts the statements of government officials who keep on blaming citizens, who keep on blaming uh, mostly poor communities uh, for uh, the continued spread of uh, COVID-19. Fortunately, we are hearing other government officials step up and actually uh, communicate a more positive uh, and uh, forward-looking message. Here is the mayor of Iloilo City. This is one uh, of the cities that have successfully contained uh, COVID-19, uh, at least so far. And um, he says here, and I quote, Ilongos are obedient. Some of them forget to bring or wear masks, but if we remind them, they will comply. I don't agree with jailing violators for lack of sufficient detention facilities, and we don't have appropriations to feed them for 10 to 30 days. The enemy is the virus, not the people. We should look at things correctly. If we jail all people, the virus will disappear from the streets because it is now in the jails. So I believe this is a very practical response by a very practical leader who sees the root cause of the difficulty of uh, poor Filipinos uh, in terms of complying with the lockdown and the mobility restrictions. Because without government support, without social protection, they will need to go out in order to continue to earn a living in order to prevent their families from going hungry, hungry uh, and, and suffering, suffering possibly what could be a worse fate than COVID-19. So uh, I just want to point out another uh, leader, uh, point of pride, uh, this uh, young mayor of Pasig City is a graduate of my school, the Ateneo School of Government. And here, uh, the mayor of Pasig City, Mayor Vico Soto, partnered with stakeholders, uh, including the private sector. And here, in this case, uh, a company that is in charge of logistics, of delivering food. Uh, and he found jobs for some of his tricycle drivers. These are small um, uh, vehicles uh, that are usually, during a non-lockdown situation, this is what people would use in order to get to work, in order to move around. Uh, but since uh, we are in lockdown and there, is, there are mobility restrictions, they needed income streams in order to continue to earn, in order to prevent hunger. And so here, this young mayor, in a very innovative way, found a partnership with the private sector in order to secure income streams uh, for uh, his constituents uh, who are tricycle drivers. So this is part of that agility of leadership and agility of good governance that is required in order to find solutions uh, and enhance the adaptability of communities, of families to the COVID-19 health pandemic instead of blaming them for the continued spread of the pandemic to find ways to support them, uh, which many Filipinos, uh, according to the emerging evidence, do want to comply with the mobility restrictions. It's just that they are not able to because of their need to keep earning incomes and to prevent their families from going hungry. So let me end there and uh, let me thank you uh, for uh, giving me the chance to present to you. Okay, can you, hear, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Mendoza. Uh, very rich and very informative presentation. Although the YouTube, uh, the, the video was not that clear, but I guess uh, uh, many of us watch it in the, through the YouTube directory. Uh, anyway, let me just briefly summarize that uh, the presentation, although it was very rich, so hard to, sum to you know, summarize it.
we, we have some inputs as uh, so how the COVID-19 impact in, in, in our uh, the Asia Pacific. And so it gives us opportunities and challenges. So we have a long, like, uh, so we have a present two presentations, very rich and informative. So we will have a 20 minute uh, break for some digestion. And meanwhile, so please, you know, if you have any questions, prepare for the questions. And also think about what struck me from this input. So after 20 minutes break, and then we will gather, and then we will have a questions and answer session, followed by some, you know, sharings, what struck me from this input. So now it's 11, 11. So we will have a 20 minute break and we will 19 minute break and we will gather 11.30 in the Philippine time. As we, okay. So we will gather 11, uh, 11.30 in the Philippine time. Okay. Thank you very okay. much for the tennis. I think in Indonesian time, 10.30, I think will be coming back. Thank you.
uh, we are ready for the tennis. You can turn on your microphone if you want to. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, good. Thank you very much. I, I hope that you have a very nice break. About 20 minutes. Relax. Stretch. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, during the break, I, I received some inputs and uh, some questions. I guess some of you already saw that. Uh, so, bro. First, first let, let me read, read it. And, and if you if like, you like to add something, something more, more then, 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 then I'm going to give. So, so uh, the, for, for the speaker, the, the one, one father, father, and then three questions. How can spirituality promote action against inequality in a pandemic situation where collective actions are often limited to online platforms? So please share effective programs from Sanatadama Dharma University. And the second question, that's a more fundamental one. Uh, what is meant by intimacy and why does it matter? So, so pedagogy of intimacy you emphasized. So what do you mean by intimacy and why does it matter? And third question is how will it be possible to create intimacy in the online education? So in Korean context, Many students complained the lack of intimacy and vivid relationship among peers between students and teachers in this online contact, online education. So, so your presentation seems seems to be different from the, our experience. I wonder okay, that was a question. So these are the, the question for the father and Andalas. And uh, for speaker to the, uh, Dr. Mendoza, Dr. Mendoza, what the social and political indication indicators point to democracy still alive during a pandemic where good policies are most effective when centralized? So, so expecting the, the experiences from the Filipino context. So these are the questions so far I have received. And so, so first, the Father Andalas, would you like to respond to these three questions? Uh, intimacy and intimacy is uh, deepened uh, by our readiness to enter into relationship with God. Uh, so that's kind of the basic meaning of intimacy that I have in mind when I talk about uh, the pedagogy of intimacy. Uh, it is true that uh, it is quite challenging, especially when uh, school Centralism is still uh, hegemonic uh, in our uh, educational institution. Then online education means uh, merely transferring all knowledges that previously distributed in class into online uh, education. And it causes that the materials are quite heavy for students because uh, you do not customize at all. You just transfer all knowledge 
uh, to online learning. So what I have in mind when we talk about the pedagogy of intimacy, that the school actually share with parents at home. Because uh, in, uh, in my research, especially with ordinary mothers uh, who accompany their children at home, uh, home is also a place and a time for learning. And then uh, at home, we, they actually customize learning uh, because we begin to see that uh, there is an existential knowledge that we, uh, we can learn from home, not only from school, uh, but probably because we do not yet share almost equally uh, and the school is quite uh, center, centralized uh, in running online education, then it becomes a burden for many students as uh, our friends in Korea uh, already shared it. Yeah? Uh, and also uh, as our experience at Sanata Dharma, I think uh, we need to train uh, faculty uh, to have more intimate relationship with students uh, in online education. Yeah? Uh, because uh, as our research uh, on our faculty, sometimes uh, teaching online means that you only transfer uh, materials to students. And sometimes you just ignore the importance of relationship that you need to build with students. Uh, with simple uh, saying hello to them, but also to customize uh, our teaching. So what we have in mind about online education is beyond teaching. Uh, and because we realize that uh, many of our students come from middle and also low class society, then we need to manage our online education. Uh, for instance, uh, from our experience, we finally decide that only half of our online class require uh, faculty to use video conference, for instance. And then other classes, uh, we give uh, students to have more uh, self-determined uh, learning uh, by having activities that they can do at home. And it is still related to our online uh, learning. So that kind of sharing, I think, uh, becomes a key factor in uh, online education. Because without sharing between uh, home and school, then uh, online education will become quite burdening, not only for students, but also for parents who accompany students uh, to online learning at, uh, from home. Okay, okay, now. So, so thank you for the, and, and the last, I think still there is, I forgot one question uh, raised by the Albin. Albin, would you like to say your question, bring your question? Uh, thank you, Father Dennis. Uh, Father Andalas, I just wanted yeah. to ask, uh, on a practical basis, uh, as you mentioned that most of some of your students are from lower income groups. Yeah. How do you make sure, first of all, that everyone has access to a gadget? Of course, uh, most people have cell phones up and down the income groups. But the other question for us that we face here is really connectivity. Uh, hmm. We have poor internet connectivities outside the city. And if students are locked in the villages, it's almost impossible. And of course, you hear these incredible stories uh, in recent months of this girl who had to climb a tree just to get uh, connectivity yeah. to sit for exam. <laughs> how, do you, how do you resolve that uh, in Sanata Dhamma? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, it is an interesting question uh, because I guess we share a similar challenge, yeah? especially when uh, many of our students come from uh, islands other than Java <coughs> that is considered as uh, having a good uh, internet connection. Yeah? Uh, actually, during uh, pandemic, uh, there are many uh, group of students. They made kind of internal survey among themselves, among study programs and also department and also uh, 
we have also uh, our university uh, make uh, made a survey uh, on digital inclusivity yeah? and and we realized that uh, as also uh, the second speaker uh, mentioned also that mm -hmm. uh, the digital inclusivity is uh, is not yet uh, uh, equally shared yeah? uh, uh, by many students. Uh, so what we have uh, in mind is that uh, there are stories of uh, teachers uh, visiting students here. Yeah? Uh, uh, at our campus, we have discussion about the possibility of inviting students uh, to come to our class uh, because probably some courses require uh, their presence, yeah, and also because of the uh, financial uh, instability. Uh, so if they live close by the campus, and then we can manage that uh, some students we prioritize them. Uh, to come to campus, and then the the other initiative that uh, uh, some of our faculty do is how to make our online courses uh, kind of light enough so that uh, the student can access uh, the knowledge that they require to to master. Yeah? For instance, rather than video conference, they make it more kind of audio one, like podcasting. Uh, it is quite uh, light for many students. Uh, also, uh, we also suggest them to download in the lowest resolution uh, for them. Uh, so this kind of initiatives, uh, I guess, uh, help our students to become more accessible. And on the part of our campus, we have also financial assistance for students. So we, uh, we give discount to the uh, tuition that they need to pay. And then also we give uh, kind of uh, some gigabytes uh, uh, for them so that they can access more to courses that probably require more for them to have video conference and uh, other application that probably require more kind of financial stability. Okay. Uh, it is still quite a challenge uh, for us and probably, uh, yeah, we can share kind of the best possible way uh, to deal with digital inclusivity. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Fernando Luz. And I think that the digital inclusivity is also very significantly addressed by by you know the Professor Mendoza. So, so would you like to add more and then respond to the question that 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 was posted and and in, in the chatting? about the political indicator. First, first starting with the digital inclusivity. Thank you, Father Dennis. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, very okay. good. Good. Uh, first, I apologize for the grainy uh, video, but uh, I, I, shared the, I shared the presentation nonetheless, and we're, we're st still learning uh, to thrive in this new environment. <laughs> uh, <laughs> hopefully, we will keep on improving. Uh, but uh, I, I just want to add that on inclusivity, I think um, on a more philosophical level, it makes us think about uh, the role of the public good in yeah. different societies. Yeah. Because before, you, you can purchase internet access uh, and you can have private providers. But I think uh, there will now be uh, maybe a democratic argument to make internet access uh, basically a public good. Uh, because uh, so many of uh, our activities will now be latched on to the inclusivity of this platform. Yeah. And I think this is a discussion that is well advanced in many industrial countries, mm -hmm. but not yet uh, a big political discussion in Asia Pacific, certainly not in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. But I, I do see good trends. Uh, I see some cities now trying to provide pockets of free Wi-Fi in the city which uh, many young people use. Uh, it's also very uh, uh, commercially enticing to make the Wi-Fi uh, available because you can now have tourists, you can now have, um, at least in the pre-COVID times, uh, obviously. Uh, but uh, some cities are now making this free. But there is not yet uh, really a strong plan nor a funding plan to make uh, internet access across 
we, we have 7,500 plus islands in the Philippines, second most archipelagic in the world. So you can imagine the investment uh, challenges of making it available to the entire country. But certainly that's a discussion that I think uh, is going to be necessary, uh, not just in uh, right now with the COVID, but also in the post-COVID uh, scenario where we want to prepare for a new situation where diseases can pop up like COVID. Uh, COVID is not the first coronavirus to hit mankind, as you know. Uh, and so we expect there will be more. So that's my quick uh, input there. Uh, my, my answer to the question is, um, basically, if I understand correctly, is asking what are the good practices that can be centralized? And I think it links to uh, internet and connectivity as well, which is, uh, my answer is transparency. Uh, I, I think at no point uh, compared to before is transparency so important right now because of uncertainty uh, and, and, the, and the risks we all face. So there's a lot of uncertainty at the individual level, at the family level. And then you compound that with disinformation and fake news, which uh, many citizens are exposed to. So I, I think a strong plan on transparency that puts forward facts, evidence, and builds trust is, is going to be a strong input into the public space also. And our schools will be critical in playing a big role in this, uh, primarily because of the nature of our scholarly work as uh, arbiters of uh, evidence and, and data gathering, right? Uh, so, so I do think uh, this is going to be critical uh, that, that transparency, and uh, I'm happy to share some of our government agencies, despite the challenges, are still practicing a big degree of transparency, which is not even stipulated in law. They have made it a decision at the bureaucratic level to practice this transparency. So even under populist regimes, you may have uh, a strong institutions and bureaucratic uh, independence in some aspects, and certainly this practice of transparency in COVID-19 data, uh, the number of cases, even though it is still um, you know, not perfect in terms of the data. Uh, I noted the comment earlier by our colleague from Malaysia uh, you know, in terms of uh, whether we trust the data, whether we have enough information. That is, I think, the case for both industrial and developing countries. Um, it, it, uh, it's sort of uh, the trust in the data is going to be critical. So, the transparency is also going to be important. But I just want to add uh, on the democratic front, uh, what gives me a little hope that democracy is alive is that a lot of young people are accessing the online uh, platforms, Facebook, Twitter, uh, and uh, if people are able to converge in these spaces as the new public space, in fact, it's not new, it's not it's just that there's <laughs> so we've always had Twitter, we've always had Facebook, but right now it's even more important because we can't go out. It's the only place to go. Uh, so, so I think the young people are quite active there and uh, converging, exchanging ideas, hosting webinars. I see that they are organizing their own events sometimes, uh, which is good because you don't need a school of government to organize a discussion on policy for them. Uh, and, and I think this is going to be critical my concern has to do with uh, the vulnerabilities that we now can see. What if uh, internet suddenly goes down? What if online structures are suddenly debilitated? Not by uh, an act of God, by, but an act of uh, a deliberate act of destruction. <laughs> so uh, we, we would have little other options uh, because of our complete dependence on some of the platforms that we have now. So, so I think Democracy will have to adapt, uh, and I think it will have to be innovative in order to be resilient in this new space, in this new, new normal, as we call it. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Thank you very much. So the, res the, two pre the presenters responded that the first regarding that this intimacy, just to, to, to me, the intimacy remind me of the Sakura personalist, the personal care and Jesuit pedagogy. So how can you practice in this online situation, I think? And that's it. And uh, the, the Professor Mendoza's 
responded about this and uh, the internet access as a public good, uh, uh, similar to the health or education or social protection. So, so how to strengthen our public good? Uh, you know, that's uh, here's the first point. And the second one is about the transparency of the government. And he seems to be uh, optimistic regarding the the lively democracy in this pandemic era, even though we cannot gather and, and the, in the offline, but uh, still there are many the young people engaged in the, this online activities. So he finds hope. So do you have any more questions? Well, and uh, you are welcome to share your, you know, what struck me from this, you know, two inputs. Oh, there's a question, I think, Father Dennis, from, uh, I don't have the name, but Galaxy Tab A. Uh -huh. <laughs> Girish. Girish. <laughs> Girish, Girish. Uh -huh. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Yes. yes, from Myanmar, social delegate. Okay. Yes. Uh, the question or the comment to Father uh, Andalus. Yes when he was speaking about uh, very inspiring and thought provoking, what I would like to hear from you is about when you were sharing about the disability and the mobility, and you really brought out a, a picture of uh, a person with a disability, the girl. Yes. And when you were sharing about that admission process or choosing of the course, the father cried, and you were also emotionally charged when you were sharing about it. Now, my question to you is, when we are talking about inclusive approach, inclusion at this particular moment, where the COVID-19 uh, has created this disability in our whole education system, still we are trying for this inclusive, inclusive process. Internet accessibility we talk about, but when the time came for the admission for the girl and choosing of the course, I think the father has to try this much in Sanatana Dharma University. Do you have a policy of uh, education for all, inclusion of persons with a disability of various kinds, or if it is an online course, if a person is with a hearing impairment, do you have in the online course sign language for persons with a hearing impairment? That's my question to you. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, we we are as a Jesuit university here. We are trying to to embrace uh, all students coming uh, both with uh, some special abilities, uh, not to be excluded from our campus. Uh, I myself uh, uh, at several semester actually I uh, I met. Uh, students with special abilities in my class, uh, without the ability to see, uh, without uh, kind of uh, disability on his uh, his or her hearing, and I guess in the near future uh, we need to be more uh, ready to welcome uh, more students with uh, disability. Uh, backgrounds uh, and and using sign language uh, I think uh, will become more a requirement yeah? uh, at our campus we actually we have uh, a center uh, to for uh, those who are with uh, special abilities uh, especially children with abilities at our uh, study program, especially for elementary level. So it is quite an initiative to, to make our campus more conscious that they exist and they are more and more yeah, at uh, our Jesuit school. Yeah? Uh, uh, right now, probably it is an experience of kind of in institutional conversion from our part, because uh, often that we still ignore their, their existence, yeah? because probably by percentage, they are still considered very small in number. Uh, but 
there are kind of uh, some experiences that we realize that they are that they exist and they want to enter into our university. Uh, for instance, uh, the place where I am now at the second floor, a couple of months ago, there was an experience of a kind of prospective student. Uh, she has disability and we don't have lift at this building and she needs to walk to the second floor. Yeah? And and uh, kind of our worker, yeah, uh, because there is no way uh, to just leave. Then uh, he asked whether it is possible for her to to walk to the second floor, yeah, and it is quite challenging for her, yeah. So it is an experience for us to embrace more, yeah, digital inclusivity, but also inclusivity in a wider context, uh, especially students with uh, special ability. Uh, so although probably uh, we are still a small in percentage, but we try our best, yeah? So actually I found this picture just this morning and I was quite happy to see her because after quite some time I lost contact with her, but several times at other campus, I actually met her and asked whether she has difficulty uh, in classes, whether uh, she got help uh, from her friends, yeah, and it is quite touching uh, because we have some students with special abilities and their fellow friends, yeah, actually uh, they bring them to class, yeah, and they escorted them to, uh, so that they have access with our limitation in facilities, yeah, so they. Uh, Kind of, they make sure that these students uh, feel comfortable at our campus, and it is uh, an initiative that we need to grow more yeah? uh, toward inclusivity, uh, toward students with special abilities. Uh, thank you uh, for your question. So the students who are disabled can, you know, fully participate in this kind of education. So that question of the rest, and thank you for the responses. There, yeah. Uh -huh. So, so one more question that is a Gabi put the one, one more question. So he asked about inclusivity in the chatting. Yeah. Inclusivity, inclusivity in education during this time of COVID tied to online education or to education in general. Yeah. yeah. So especially in coming to the, what is it, the Cambodian context. So is it better to focus on working online inclusivity or the offline education approaches too, or a combination? So Gabi raised a very interesting point. And then another question, so Alvin, uh, to both speakers, what initiatives are taken to reach out to poor and vulnerable at this time? So uh, first, uh, uh, Professor Mendoza, would you like to address the second question about uh, what, what initiatives that, uh, the Ateneo uh, has taken to reach out to poor and vulnerable? Yes, uh, Father Dennis, the Ateneo has um, several initiatives ongoing right now, including um, a, a drive to help uh, feed the hungry and contribute to frontliners. These are the people who are actually uh, in, in the medical community mostly who need help uh, right now to fight the virus. Um, so we've been fundraising and uh, lots of the young people are actually engaged in this, uh, helping in that uh, campaign to contribute uh, and to show generosity to these groups that need help, uh, but also particularly those who are vulnerable, the poor and low income communities. So we have uh, particular groups that are engaged in this area uh, and uh, actually, I'm, I'm in the graduate school, so I'm not directly involved uh, with the undergraduate uh, activities. But speaking for my school, which is the Ateneo School of Government, um, our characteristic is that 80% uh, of our students are actually government uh, public servants. They are elected officials or actually bureaucrats. 
and 60% of uh, my students are actually frontliners also. Mm -hmm. So they're in the military, the police, they are in the Department of Health. Uh, so um, on our side, we, we are actually quite uh, uh, engaged in fighting COVID-19 indirectly through our students because they themselves are in the front lines. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, what we have tried to do as a school, at least one part of it, uh, we see uh, because of the trends that I mentioned earlier on populism, on risks to democracy, also on the difficult trade-offs that uh, the public sector now faces, we have integrated into our teaching curriculum a strong ethics and leadership component so that our students get a stronger appreciation, a stronger prepara preparation uh, in this area. Uh, and uh, we feel this is going to be extremely important, particularly for our national security students, mm -hmm. those who are in the Philippine National Police and the Armed Forces of the Philippines. Mm -hmm. So we, we have sort of that response there. Uh, some of my students are also elected officials, such as the student that I mentioned in my presentation, Mayor Vico. So we are also directly uh, helping some ex-students who are now uh, sort of working uh, in government and particularly in the in the local government uh, to respond to the crisis. Uh -huh. Thank you very much. So, you know, when I look at you in the video, you know, your back, background, the, there is a slogan, forming leaders, uh, leading reforms. I think that's what you are trying to do. When I read this, so one verse, the, the Father Kolbenbach, the former Father General, he made a speech at Santa Clara University in the year of the 2000 when he worked in the Jeju University in Lebanon. Uh, that university was uh, prestigious and uh, famous, but produced uh, some uh, corrupted elites. <laughs> so, so I hope that, that, that the forming leaders and leading reforms in this motto that really you know, works. It's not just the slogan and it, it works. So, and you. Thank you. And I feel a little bit of the time, you know, pressure. So it's already one, one, uh, 12 or five, uh, passing two hours at limited time. I like to, before moving forward, I'd like to ask the organizer, Father Suyadi, how long can we have more time? <laughs> Is it really depends on you if you are available and then we, we can extend, for example, 30 minutes, but uh -huh. so <laughs> what do you think? Uh, if, for me, I'm okay. So we are now starting to, to discuss or engage in conversation. So I'd like to extend more. So if those who have another you know, business, you know, feel free to leave. Yeah, perhaps I can make an announcement first. Uh, it's an okay, important answer. announcement before anybody leaves. So don't, oh, yes. don't leave yet. Let me speak first. Is that okay? Yeah, that's okay. Yes. Uh, so uh, as you see, time is running out. We would like to make a very important request to everyone. Uh, and this is a little bit of uh, a homework uh, that we would like to ask you to do uh, by the end of today. Uh, as you can see, I am now uh, sharing my screen. Uh, are you able to see my screen? Yes. 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 Okay. Yes. So uh, uh, after this Zoom, I will send an email to all of you. Okay. Uh, and uh, I would, uh, we would like to request that uh, you also uh, in, uh, individually share your own uh, answers with uh, everyone. Uh, as you can see for today's session, uh, the topic was uh, spirituality and religion, and secondly, the poor and vulnerable groups. Uh, so for each of these topics, we would like to hear your local experience as well. Um, uh, your, what's happening in your neighborhood, in your local place? Three questions. How has COVID affected uh, these uh, uh, these aspects of people's life, these two aspects, spirituality and also the poor, uh, what do you think is likely to be the, the emerging or the new uh, situation? Uh, you can talk about both lights and shadows, but 
these are not, uh, we, we hope to hear not theoretical things, but really uh, what you are really seeing. Uh, and then the third uh, uh, question will be, what are the opportunities for us? Uh, in other words, for these three questions, we really want to listen to the signs of the times. We don't want to jump into solutions yet, but these first two uh, conferences, the first two sessions, Monday and Wednesday, is really to hear out uh, what is happening on the ground, what are the signs of the times. So uh, the homework for today is that I will uh, share, uh, I will send you a, 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 an email uh, with these questions and uh, we would like to request that you respond uh, by the end of today and so that I will collate everyone's answers and disseminate uh, by tomorrow. All right? All right. Yeah, and then also uh, in that email, which I'll send to everyone, if you have even further questions for our uh, distinguished speakers, you can ask and then we can treat that email as a, a forum to have questions and answers, uh, especially if those of you who, who are who I have to leave right now and you have still further questions and, and, and you are curious about the other people's answers too. Okay, thank you very much, Krishna. So everybody, you got it, the, the, the three questions the, regarding the spirituality and will, what is it, the, the three questions. Yes, don't worry, I will, I will send you an email immediately with the three questions and what, what we would yes. like to ask of you, your homework. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Uh, so now we have a little bit of a more extended time. So uh, saying, may, maybe 15, 15, 15 minutes or 20 minutes. So yeah. feel free to leave if you have the business. So meanwhile, we have some more questions. Uh, we still did not talk, did not share about the Gabby's question about incl inclusivity. And then Fernando questioned about the migrants. So, so let me, let me Gabi, would you like to say repeat your question in words? Gabi, no. Yes, yes, okay. yes. Yes. Um, um, I was just curious if um, there is a the general trend is towards uh, everything becomes online, and we in the villages uh, would focus on giving like Wi-Fi accessibility to students? Or is there uh, things that are advantages for offline, even in smaller groups? Or is it a combination of, of both in terms of future trends? Uh -huh. I think the question is not just, a, not just a, uh, the, for the Andalus, right? So anybody can respond. Yeah, should I respond? Yeah, go okay. ahead. Yeah. Uh, at our Jesuit University, uh, we have for about uh, 2,000 students out of 11,000 uh, who, who really need financial assistance. Yeah? So we have different arrangements, uh, especially after the pandemic season. Uh, for instance, uh, for those who are really poor, we give them free tuition. And then those who have, uh, those parents who uh, kind of, they have uh, kind of financial inclusivity, uh, although probably not quite strong, then we give them 50% uh, free. And then for other students, we give them 25% free. So it is kind of initiative from our Jesuit University to embrace more, to reach more, uh, low class and middle class students to have uh, good access of education at our campus. Yeah? Uh, because our campus is considered uh, as uh, an excellent one, especially for those who want to study uh, uh, teaching uh, department. Yeah? Uh, so we want to make sure that uh, because uh, when we include them uh, 
in our university, then they will have bigger impact in the society because they will become teachers, especially, yeah? uh, and they can go on the frontier lines of our society, yeah? uh, including uh, those who work as kind of migrant worker. Yeah? Uh, we have also initiative, especially with our <coughs> uh, mobile library, uh, to reach out uh, students at lower uh, education background, uh, at elementary, also junior high, and then high school, uh, also to have access to knowledge. Yeah? Uh, so they don't need to come to our campus, but we come to where they are right now. Yeah? Uh, so this initiative, uh, I think, uh, will give more access, uh, especially for poor students and also uh, students with uh, other vulnerabilities or the disabilities uh, to access to uh, knowledge. Yeah? Uh, just a short uh, addition to my uh, answer to the previous questions. Uh, I guess the idea of intimacy is close to the idea of uh, scholar affectus when uh, we were in the novitiate. Yeah? So, uh, or if we uh, use the terminology of uh, Paulo Freire, it is kind of pedagogy of the heart. Yeah? Uh, because uh, often uh, education becomes kind of a, a cognitive exercise that marginalizes affection, emotion, that we consider as a Jesuit university, uh, affection is quite central to our education. Uh, so by the pedagogy of intimacy, we actually redeem uh, education to become more holistic again, not just uh, a rational exercise. Uh, and uh, especially, after the pandemic season, uh, during the pandemic season, home is where the heart is. Home is where the affection is. Home is where the intimacy is located. Uh, and it is time actually for, the, for our Jesuit school to learn from informal education, especially education done at home. Because ordinary, ordinary mothers they are what we call as informal teachers. They are informal, even pedagogues. And what I have in mind when I talk about pedagogy of intimacy, uh, although I claim that Sanada Dharma is a birthplace of the one birthplace of the pedagogy of intimacy, but the natural place where this pedagogy is carried out is home. Uh, sadly, sometimes the school doesn't realize it yet. And we keep on make our educational institution so centralizing that it marginalizes the role of home and also the role of other places uh, for uh, making us realize the importance of intimacy in our education. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So, the in, what is the inclusivity and regarding the in, inclusivity, we addressed this in you know, internet access or other disabilities and the villagers, so online, offline educations. And Fernando raised another from the another angle. Fernando, would you like to address your uh, say your questions regarding the migrant workers? Yes, uh, could you hear me? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Uh, my question, actually, I think Rona has started to answer is uh, regarding migrant workers who are in some way disabled to access to continuous education because of time or space limitation and disabilities, yeah. no? Especially those who are renewing uh, cycles of two years and two years and two years abroad, and uh, basically they are not learning anymore. And some of them, some of them has even tertiary degrees, but they're basically in a limbo in terms of education. So what does the universities have any programs from which they can profit from 
such as certificates or diplomas or courses that can offer regular credits that eventually can be redeemed when they come when they go back um, and designed for them no because there is a, a need of design in terms of uh, they don't have much time uh, is really a challenge so I, I'm just asking if the our two universities or maybe Sogan also uh, has uh, some kind of uh, uh, development in this area, working maybe with local universities where the migrant workers are. So, for instance, they can uh, they can be a, 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 an alliance between universities where the, uh, the courses can be given to migrant workers in their places. Yeah. So, let let me try to answer, uh, mm -hmm. elaborate on my answer, perhaps, uh, Father Fernando. The Ateneo School of Government, I have two faculty whose vocation it is uh, to basically work with uh, migrant communities uh, abroad. And uh, we have a program right now. Uh, it's not a graduate degree and it's not an undergraduate degree. It's, we, we call it uh, somewhat of an executive education sort of uh, program, short program that includes social entrepreneurship, leadership, uh, but also a lot of, uh, I would call it companionship and community building uh, among the migrant communities so that uh, they were offering this uh, for the past 10 years before COVID-19 uh, as a way to actually help migrants prepare to come back home. Mm -hmm. uh, so this, this was being offered, uh, it's called OFW Life. Mm -hmm. uh, and I can send you more details if you want to be in touch with them. We're, we're actually uh, offering this program in about 25 cities abroad where Filipinos are uh, mm -hmm. quite numerous, migrant co communities are quite numerous. Now, what happened with the COVID-19 is that we adjusted the program because now the main demand is almost immediate. Many of them are getting sent back home because their contracts are not being renewed. Uh, and so there is a lot of anxiety and a lot of uncertainty, mm -hmm. a lot of uh, personal pressure on many of them. Uh, and then also the need for psychological support for some of the OFWs who are sort of losing hope. Uh, so we, we, uh, we opted for more inclusive webinars uh, to sort of offer this. And so they are tapping the two faculty of mine whose vocation it is to, to basically lead this program. They're tapping psychologists, they're tapping different experts to sort of engage uh, the OFW community, Overseas Filipino Workers, it's sort of an acronym, uh, in this way to provide this support. Um, and uh, just so you know, our partners are not usually foreign universities or foreign academic institutions. Our partners are usually uh, the consulates of the Philippines, the missions of the Philippines abroad so that they offer a physical space for possible meeting of the OFW community. But since now it's uh, sort of done online, uh, that's not necessarily so important anymore, but it's something that we can still draw on. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, I, I want to respond uh, shortly to Fernando's question. Uh -huh. uh, briefly, yes. Yeah, briefly. I feel time uh, pressure. Okay. Uh, at our strategic, uh, strategic plans uh, as a university, uh, we imagine that uh, we will have more uh, online learning uh, and it is uh, it will be accessible uh, for those uh, who are migrant workers. Uh, and probably uh, by putting them kind of in a kind of uh, like YouTube and other social media, it will become easier for them if they have time and also place constraints uh, to, uh, to have formal education. So that kind of informal education, I guess, will, will become more possible for them. And I guess we need still to uh, negotiate yeah, whether university will give them certificate or other documents that will help them to have uh, more skill uh, uh, and they are kind of they have documents uh, when uh, some institution may, may require them. Yeah? So it is an ongoing uh, discussion in our university, but we have a quite clear strategic plan 
to have more online uh, learning that made, will make possible, especially for those who have time and also place constraints and also uh, they, they are not yet uh, financially uh, inclusive yet. Yeah? Uh, mm -hmm. I hope it, uh, it will help uh, to answer your question, Fernando. Thank you. Yes, yes, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to, to give more the room for the participants from the different part of the world. So from Australia. Anyone like to bring your experiences and reflections from Australia? Nobody's here? Okay. Then anyone like to say the final question? For me, uh, just to be for closing that, you know, uh, for me, it was very interesting that uh, the first I, the question was very challenging, the impact of COVID and especially regarding the spirituality and religion. I thought about that in the context of Korea. And the one thing that occurred to my mind was because this social distance is so much emphasized in the Korean context, you know, protecting ourselves. So the first year grade student coming to the school, and that's their first social life in the, in the but what they learn for the first time in their life is uh, keeping the distance. So how did it impact? And they're making relationship with the others. <laughs> So that was very, this is not just a social, this is very spiritual. <laughs> so that was, a, that's the thing that I'm very curious, this COVID-19 generation, how, what kind of person they would become in the future, that generation. So that was my just a simple, short uh, reflection. And then another one is more as a, as a priest, this, you know, the online mass. It seems like it works, but at the same time, how can we reconcile with this sacramentality of our human body? You know, our sacramental life, the body, the physical touch is very important. And the communion, it's a receiving communion. So how the church, every Jesuit can respond to this new situation. So to me, it was very, I'm, I'm still you know, thinking about that. So these two things I like to briefly share regarding the, the, the religion and spirituality. And for just the closing, so it was a very stimulating conversation and rich information and bring the many, you know, the concrete experiences that, uh, and also different angles. So we are now experiencing very, you know, new so-called new normal or unprecedented experience in this era. And it seems like that the COVID-19 really reveals the structures, you know, we already know that so the inequality or social and political economic, you know, dimensions, but that becomes more clearer. So as Professor Mendoza's, as, you know, the, this cartoon, and regarding the online, you know, so, so poverty really drags the, 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 those are disadvantaged. That cartoon really captures. So in this situation, this, you know, the marginal, marginalization the continued or deepened. So the task for us Jesuit or, what, you know, the, whoever we have the goodwill, this, uh, how can we, you know, promote this inclusivity so that was about the keyword today we you know in our discussion or sharings. So I think our reflection and our discussion will continue. So today is the first day. So it was very rich and the Wednesday we will have a from different angle we will have a you know more listening and conversations. So thank you very much you know for the whole the sessions, your participation. 
And I'd like to give this microphone to, to, to whom? The CID? To Mr. Oda, please, Mr. Oda. Thank you. Um, can you hear me yeah. okay? Yes, okay, thank you very much. So it has been an uh, inspiring, engaging, and fruitful conversation that we have. So uh, it was scheduled uh, until 11, but Indonesian time now it's uh, 11.30. So I think um, this is the end of our discussion today. I have just uh, posted in the chat box there the um, schedule for the next webinar, day two, 26th of August. Um, you know, you have the meet, meeting ID and also the passcode and the link there, but actually uh, it has been sent through email also. So thank you very much. And Father Adriano Suryati, do, do you, do you uh, want to say something? Yes, I just want to thanks Professor Ron, Father Mutiara Andalas, and also Father Dennis to share your insightful inputs so that I think this is very useful for us to continue our process. In case you would like to join in the following day on Wednesday, you are most welcome. So again, on behalf of uh, the organizing committee, we would like to thank you. So thank you, Father, and big applause to all the speakers, the moderator, and all of us. Thank you, and uh, see you on Wednesday. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Yeah. yeah.